Hello, I'm Alma Angeles. We're moving to the next stage of the pandemic, and as the world resets to the new normal, we find ourselves seeking the right balance between health and livelihood, constantly adjusting the boundaries between liberty and responsibility. On tonight's headlines. New Zealand's Prime Minister Hacinda Ardern postpones the nation's election to focus on fighting a coronavirus second wave as data shows Japan's economy has endured a historic contraction. India's coronavirus death toll soars past 50,000 and total cases head towards 3 million. Even as Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government claims the mortality rate is one of the lowest in the world. Tens of thousands of Belarusian opposition supporters gather for the largest protest rally in recent history in Minsk as President Alexander Lukashenko rejects calls to step down in a defiant speech. And Japan's economy shrank a record 7.8% in the April to June quarter, the worst contraction in the nation's modern history as the coronavirus deepens the country's economic woes. First, tens of thousands of Belarusian opposition supporters gathered for the largest protest rally in recent history in Minsk as President Alexander Lukashenko rejected calls to step down in a defiant speech. Take a look. Crowds of protesters marched through the streets to the central independent square with an AFP journalist estimating that the turnout at more than 100,000, a scale of protests not seen since the breakup of the Soviet Union. Belarusian independent news site Tut.by called the rally the largest in the history of independent Belarus. Popular opposition candidate Svetlana Tekatsovskaya has called for a weekend of protests after leaving for neighboring Lithuania following the disputed election, which gave Lukashenko 80% of the vote. More and more Belarusians have taken to the streets over the last week to condemn Lukashenko's disputed victory and a subsequent violent crackdown by riot police and abuse of detainees. The 65-year-old strongman held a rare campaign-style rally on Independence Square before the opposition protest. Take a look. The main challenger in Belarus's disputed presidential election said that she was ready to take over the country's leadership after a wave of protests against President Alexander Lukashenko. Let's listen in. Я готова принять на себя ответственность и выступить в этот период в качестве национального лидера. Yanovskaya, a 37-year-old political novice who ran after other potential candidates, including her husband, were jailed, uh, accuses Lukashenko of rigging the election and has called for a new vote since leaving for neighboring Lithuania last week under pressure from the government. According to her allies, she's been calling for demonstrations and justice for a brutal police crackdown on protesters. Prime Minister Hacinda Ardern delayed New Zealand's looming election by four weeks to October 17 after a renewed coronavirus outbreak hampered campaigning. Take a look. I should be clear that the Electoral Commission since April has planned for a range of scenarios, including the possibility of an election period where the country is at alert level two and with some areas of the country at alert level three. There is no suggestion at this point that New Zealand will be in these elevated alert levels during the September election. However, while the Electoral Commission's primary consideration 
is the delivery of a safe, accessible and credible election, there are other factors that I believe also need to be considered. These include the participation of voters and the ability of the Electoral Commission to reassure them that measures are in place to allow them to participate safely in the election. This includes vulnerable communities who might be reluctant to vote in person. In this respect, the calculation around when to hold an election is not an easy one. COVID is continuing to disrupt life around the world. Pushing an election out by several months, for instance, does not lessen the risk of disruption. This will in part be the reason why many countries have held elections while managing COVID, including South Korea, Singapore and Poland. Having weighed up all these factors and taken wide soundings, I have decided on balance to move the election by four weeks to the 17th of October. At the end of last week, I was advised that this date is achievable and presents no greater risk than had we retained the status quo. Prime Minister Arden's Labour Party is on track to win office in its own right without the minor party coalition partners, the Greens and New Zealand First or NZF, it needed during its first term. COVID-19 has returned to New Zealand after 102 days of no community transmission. The Prime Minister acknowledged there was widespread anxiety in the community over the virus's return, which was first detected in four family members in Auckland last Tuesday. By Sunday, the Auckland cluster had grown to 49 confirmed cases, and Prime Minister Arden said she spent the weekend consulting with party leaders and the Electoral Commission over the vote's date. The virus is a strain not previously seen in New Zealand, and National Health Director General Ashley Bloomfield said tests to check if it was imported via freight sent to an Auckland cool room facility were still being processed. Thousands of Protestant church members in Seoul have been asked to quarantine, according to South Korean authorities, as the country battles virus clusters linked to religious groups. The largest current cluster is centered on the uh, Sarang Jail Church in Seoul, headed by a controversial conservative pastor who is a leading figure in protests against President Moon Jae-in. At a press conference on Monday, a lawyer for the church accused the government of unprecedented abuse of authority over the latest measures. Over the weekend, the capital and neighboring Jeonji province, between them home to nearly half the population, banned all religious gatherings and urged residents to avoid unnecessary travel. After a burst of new cases sparked fears of a major second wave, South Korea reported 197 new infections on Monday, taking its total to 15,515, its fourth consecutive day of triple-digit increases after several weeks with numbers generally in the 30s and 40s. The largest current cluster is centered on the Sarang Jail Church in Seoul, headed by Jun Kwang Hun, a controversial conservative pastor who is a leading figure in protest against the president, Moon Jae-in. Total of 315 cases linked to the church had been confirmed by the end of the weekend. Officials said Monday, making it one of the biggest clusters so far, and around 3,400 members of the congregation had been asked to quarantine.
Japan's economy shrunk by a record 7.8 percent in April to June, the worst in 40 years. Joining us live from Japan is Dennis Liu. Hello, Dennis. Hello, Alma. Good evening. Good evening. To you and to all our televiewers. Japan's economy shrank a record 7.8 percent in the April to June quarter. It's the worst contraction in the nation's modern history. GDP contracted by the most in 40 years as the coronavirus deepens the country's economic woes. The contraction from the previous quarter was slightly worse than expectations, but it's still significantly less severe than the decline seen in many other industrial economies. Still, it is the worst economic contraction for Japan since comparable data became available in 1980. It eclipsed the brutal impact of the 2008 global financial crisis, and some analysts labeled it the worst fall since data began to be compiled in 1955. It was the third straight quarter of negative growth, confirming a deepening recession for Japan. This also raises the prospect that the government will consider pumping further stimulus into the economy. The economy contracted an annualized 27.8% with domestic demand falling 4.8% and exports of goods and services plunging 18.5%. But imports fell only 0.5%, fearing better than the 4.2% all seen in the January to March period. Japan was already struggling with a stagnating economy and the impact of a consumption tax hike implemented last year before the pandemic hit. In April and May, the government declared a state of emergency. Naoya Oshikubo, senior economist at SUNY Trust, said Japan imposed looser restriction against the coronavirus and fared better than its industrial peers. Despite the figures, analysts said the economy could now expect a rebound. Mr. Oshikubo projected 2.6 growth for the July to September quarter. Alma? All right. Uh, Dennis, uh, there were reports that uh, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was brought to the hospital today. Uh, yes, Alma. Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe sparked fresh speculation Monday about his well-being with an unexpected hours long hospital visit. Abe emerged from the Tokyo hospital where he was previously treated for ulcerative colitis more than seven hours after he entered and left by car without saying anything. His previously unannounced arrival on Monday morning prompted a local media frenzy and comes after weeks of speculation about his health. A weekly magazine report in July claimed Abe had been vomiting blood but government spokesman Yoshihide Suga insisted the prime minister was healthy. A separate government source, meanwhile, said the prime minister has been tired lately as he hasn't had time to refresh himself while dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. Opposition parties were keeping an eye on Abe's health as he has kept a low profile since the regular diet session ended in June, appearing only at several press conferences held on ceremonial occasions. In November last year, Prime Minister Abe became Japan's longest serving prime minister. Back to you, Alma. All right. Thank you very much, Dennis, for your updates there in Japan. Looking forward for more. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Alma. This is Dennis Lu reporting live from Tokyo, Japan. We live in interesting times. All right. We'll go for a short break. Eagle News will be right back. Noon hanggang ngayon, gabay natin ang MTRCB ratings sa matalino at responsabling panonood. Sa tamang pagsunod sa MTRCB ratings, 
ginagawa nating ligtas at makabuluhan ang panonood ng bawat miyembro ng Pamilyang Pilipino. Lumipas man ang panahon hanggang may Pamilyang Pilipino, andyan ang MTRCB. Bukas na po ang auditions para sa tagisan ng galing part 2. Mag-audition na po kayo sapagkat mahigit sa 7 million pesos ang nagaantay na papremyo sa kategorya ng sayawan at kantahan. Opo, tagisan ng galing part 2. Dito lamang po yan sa Net 25. All right, another uh, major economy has uh, its GDP contract, contracted by 12.2% uh, most in more than 20 years. This is in Thailand. Joining us from Bangkok is Faye Barty. Hello, Faye. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are correct. The data shows that Thailand's economy suffered its first constraint contraction since the Asian financial crisis more than two decades ago. The kingdom has largely escaped the worst of the disease, registering 3,300 cases and 58 deaths despite being the first country outside China to register an infection in January. The pandemic's spread lockdowns brought the economy to a staggering halt, shrinking 12.2% in the second quarter growth according to the Office of National Economic and Social Development Council, or the NESDC. The NESDC forecasts a 7.5% contraction in 2020. The slump is not, a, not as dramatic as some regional peers, said economist Alex Holmes of, Alex Holmes of Singapore-based Capital Economics, pointing out Singapore, Malaysia, and the Philippines saw worse readings. But he said the outlook remains one of the worst in the region because of Thailand's reliance on tourism. Some 40 million tourists were expected to arrive in the kingdom this year, but the travel industry was the first casualty when pandemic lockdowns went into effect globally in March. According to the NESDC, the absence of visitors was felt in the country's services sector, bruising entertainment, retail, hotels, and restaurants. The government has attempted to boost domestic tourism, putting aside a portion of a record financial stimulus passed in May to fund travel. But Thai bank Krum Sri said in a note released last week that the sector will remain weak due to near zero foreign tourists and lower domestic purchasing power. The government figures predict the pandemic could leave 8.4 million jobless of escalating gains more made over the past two decades. Back to you, Alma. Thank you very much, Faye, for your updates there in Bangkok. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Alma. This is Faye Barte reporting live from Bangkok, Thailand Bureau, and we live in interesting times. Meanwhile, hundreds protested in Madrid against the use of uh, face masks plus other restrictions. Joining us live from Spain is Mark Julius Aala. Hello, Mark. Hello, Alma. Hi. Hundreds of people rallied in Madrid to protest against the mandatory use of face masks and other restrictions imposed by the Spanish government to contain the virus pandemic. The demonstration drew a variety of attendees, including conspiracy theorists, libertarians, and opponents of vaccination. The pandemic has been described as farce and lie by several of the attendees. Many protesters did not wear a mask, even though it is required by law in public across Spain, which has seen a surge in new infections since it lifted its three-month lockdown measures on June 21. Mask wearing was initially imposed in early May as a requirement for those using public transport and was later expanded in a country where the virus has killed nearly 29,000 people. The protest comes two days after the government announced new restrictions to curb the spread of the virus. This includes the closure of discos and a ban on smoking in public areas when it is not possible to keep at least two meters from other people. Chants such as, there is no fear, 
We want to see the virus and we are not criminals. We want to breathe, could be heard at the protest. People have been challenging the COVID-19 security measures without keeping their distance and even hugging each other. Spain has seen a surge in new infections since lifting its three-month lockdown in late June. Alma? All right. Thank you very much, Mark, for your time. And uh, you keep safe, stay healthy. Thank you, Alma. Uh, this is Mark Jusaala, and we live in interesting times. Indeed. Thank you. Now to Italy, where the country has ordered a three-week closure of all dance venues and said that from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., the wearing of masks would be mandatory in public areas where groups could form. Take a look. Now, the new measure to take effect on Monday, or has taken effect today, and last, will last through September 7, comes after wrangling between the government and regions over the nightlife sector, which employs nearly 50,000 people in 3,000 clubs across the country, according to the Unite Club Operators Union, SILB. The decision coincides with the Ferragosto weekend, a major holiday, when most Italians go to the beach. Italy, the first country to be hit by the coronavirus crisis in Europe, has seen nearly 254,000 cases of COVID-19 and more than 35,000 deaths. In Canada, Public Safety Minister Bill Blair announced that the governments of Canada, the United States and Mexico have all agreed to extend the border closure to all non-essential travel until at least September. The ban is set to expire on August 21. Joining us or uh, reporting from Canada, here is Vanessa de la Cruz. The border between Canada and the U.S. is the largest international border across two countries in the world. It has been closed for non-essential traffic since March 21st. Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness Bill Blair announced the extension of the border restriction for another 30 days to September 21st. Minister Blair has mentioned that it will do whatever's necessary to keep our community safe. Dr. Theresa Tam, the Chief Public Health Officer, mentioned that she wanted to keep up Canada's good work with regards to COVID-19. However, there has been some cases where families have been split, where they could not see loved ones between the borders. The border closures get revisited every 30 days. Some people are predicting that the border closures might not reopen till next year. I'm Vanessa de la Cruz in Victoria, BC, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. India's official coronavirus death toll soared past 50,000 on Monday as the pandemic rages through smaller cities and rural areas where health care is feeble and stigmatization rife. Now, and many experts say the real numbers may be far higher due to low testing rates and because deaths are often not properly recorded in the vast and impoverished nation of 1.3 billion people. India last week overtook Britain with the world's fourth highest number of fatalities behind the U.S., Brazil and Mexico. And as of Monday, had recorded 50,921 deaths, according to the health ministry and to the Johns Hopkins University tally. With some of the world's biggest megacities and slums, India is already the third most infected nation behind the U.S. and Brazil with 2.65 million, in nearly 2.65 million infections. Despite the rising death toll, the health ministry said on Sunday that India's virus mortality rate of 1.92 percent was one of the lowest globally. <laughs> In Thailand, schools have resumed full classes. And to tell us more about it, here's Esther Odanga reporting from Patea. Thai schools were given permission by the Center for COVID-19 Administration, or CCSA, to return to full classes and school schedules with strict hygiene measures and physical distancing rules. Based on Patea News, some of the schools started normal classes last Thursday, August 13, while the remaining schools are opening back to normal schedules today. 
Schools had been previously on a variety of so-called new normal programs, such as having alternate days for students, heavily reduced classroom sizes, having some students work from home or remotely, and other similar plans. Today, the schools in the country are allowed to resume normal school schedules and increase classroom sizes, although authorities have stressed that precautions must still be taken. Those precautions include temperature checks before school as well as hand washing stations and enforcement of physical distancing. Mask wearing is mandatory at all times in school for the majority of students. Some activities and extras such as playgrounds and group activities are still not taking place. We asked an educator about her opinion in regularization of school schedule and here's her view. I think the school open is better than the study in their house because they can, can have conversation with teacher and student. When they have any question, they do not understand their lessons, they can ask the teacher in the town so we can help them in time. The CCSA has said they are concerned due to the reports from other countries that although youth appear to not get sick from COVID-19 as often as elderly or those with health conditions, they could be a major source of asymptomatic carriers and carry higher viral loads of the virus. Thailand has not had a single locally spread case officially confirmed in almost 84 days. Students must, however, keep a record of where they go after school so that officials can monitor their after-school activities in case any of them is exposed to COVID-19 and so that the proper steps can be taken to prevent the disease from spreading. Giving you the latest updates in Thailand, this is Esther Adanga. We live in interesting times. The disproportionate effect of the pandemic on young people has exacerbated inequalities and risks, reducing the productive potential of an entire generation. That is according to a new report from the International Labor Organization released on August 11. The report, Youth and COVID-19 Impacts on Jobs, Education, Rights and Mental Well-Being, indicates that the COVID-19 crisis is having a devastating effect on the education and training of young people. Take a look. Virtual press briefing. Despite best efforts from schools and training institutions in securing continuity in education through online learning, one in eight young students didn't have access to courses. This is particularly the case for young people in lower income countries and also emphasizes large digital divides across regions. 65% of young students report having learned less since the onset of the virus. 70% of young people are probably affected by anxiety and depression. The ILO therefore calls for urgent, immediate and large scale action and investments on youth employment so that we can support a safer transition for young people into productive employment and decent work. Jobs, right. She also said that uh, as regards to employment, the report shows that one in six young people have stopped working since the onset of the virus. And these job losses particularly affect younger youth and those working in critical support services, sales and crafts. In other news, Bogota imposed strict quarantine measures until August 30, which will affect over a million people living in Colombia's capital in an attempt to slow down the spread of COVID-19 and prevent the collapse of the city's intensive care network. Colombia's confirmed infections number at 468,332. Deaths is at 15,097 according to Johns Hopkins University. Now, according to Johns Hopkins University, the country has been registering a daily average of 300 deaths in the last two weeks. Colombia has one of the highest per capita mortality rates for coronavirus in the world. A British government scheme to encourage people to visit restaurants by paying a slice of the bill has boosted a sector devastated by the coronavirus, according to a study published on Monday. 
Yeah, currently I think in the situation where people are at home um, on furlough, like myself, um, I think it's nice to get out and do a little bit for the community. You know, the government are giving back to us, and I think it's great that we're giving back to the people who need it a lot. So, yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's nice to get out and about. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I hate seeing this restaurant shut. It's such amazing restaurants in London, and, and you see them shut it down. It's, it's awful. So, um, it's, whatever they're doing, I hope it works, because I, I would love to see these restaurants back, back being open. The incentive, Eat Out to Help Out, valid Monday to Wednesday through August, sees the government contribute 50% of the cost of a cafe, restaurant, or pub meal, up to 10 pounds per person. Analysis from the Center for Economics and Business Research, or CEBR, shows that despite the pandemic, it has helped to increase diner numbers by more than a quarter year on year. In the first two weeks of August, the number of people who ate out on the scheme's active days leaped 26.9%, according to CEBR. It noted that the month-long scheme, crafted by Finance Minister Rishi Sunak, would give Britain a much-needed boost towards normality. Eagle News will be right back. The search for the best continues. Tangi Senegaling Part 2 is now accepting audition entries. If you are 21 to 59 years old and have what it takes to be the next Tangi Senegaling Grand Winner as a solo performer, do it! Trio, band, or grouped act, submit your audition entries now. Just follow these guidelines. To submit audition entries for the singing category, contact Nikki at 0977 651 9504. This is your chance to be Tagi Senangaling's grand winner and win 2 million pesos. For more details and updates, visit and like the Tagi Senangaling Facebook page. What are you waiting for? Join now! The United States Postal Service is popularly known for delivering mail despite snow, rain or heat. But now it faces a new foe in President Donald Trump. The Trump administration continued to criticize and question the capabilities of the U.S. Postal Service as states prepare for a massive increase in mail-in balloting during the continuing pandemic. Take a look. Grace, absentee is good. Mail-in universal is very, very bad. There's no way they're going to get it accurately. They're off by 20 and 30 percent. And this is beyond post office. Now, with that being said, they want money for the universal mail-in uh, ballots. And they're not getting it. You know why? Because of them. The Postmaster General, Louis DeJoy, a major donor and ally of the president, is cutting the UPS budget, USPS budget, and there are calls for him to resign. Speaker Nancy Pelosi on Sunday said she would recall the House of Representatives from its summer recess to vote this week on an act to save the Postal Service. Pelosi and fellow senior Democrat Chuck Schumer also called for Postmaster General Louis DeJoy to appear before an urgent hearing of the House Oversight Committee. They requested that Postmaster General Louis DeJoy and the chairman of the USPS Board of Governors, Robert Duncan, testify. They said in a statement that DeJoy, a Trump mega donor, has acted as an accomplice in the president's campaign to cheat in the election as he launches sweeping new operational changes that degrade delivery standards. Ahead of the November 3 elections, in which millions of voters are expected to cast ballots by mail due to the coronavirus, President Trump has leveled an unprecedented attack at the USPS, opposing efforts to give the cash-strapped agency more money as part of a big new virus-related stimulus package, even as changes there have caused widespread delays in mail delivery. Mark Demonstein, the president of the American Postal Workers Union, said that President Trump wants to starve the post office to keep people from voting in the November election. Starve the, that the president wants to starve the post office to keep people from voting. That's shameful on both counts. 
Number one, the post office shouldn't be starved. And number two, everybody should have the easiest access, no matter who we're voting for, the easiest access to be able to cast that vote. And the fact that he tied it together uh, is quite an admission. Uh, the new postmaster general is a mega donor of Trump himself. Uh, that's concerning to us. It's concerning to many other people because of his financial, uh, uh, not only his financial relationships with the White House, but with private businesses that are in competition with the United States Postal Service. Uh, but we haven't seen, and the whole idea is it's not supposed to be a politicized agency. Uh, and yet here we have the hands of the White House themselves trying to tell the post office how much they should charge for a package. I just think it's incumbent upon Congress to act uh, and not, not hide behind anything else. And that's true with people on both sides of the, the major political parties in the uh, U.S. Uh, there's support there, but that support needs to be turned into action there too. It can't just be words. It really has to be action. And the minimum action right now is the $25 billion of COVID emergency relief to be appropriated uh, from Congress. And in, in, the, in the intermediate run, it's, it's dire and it's urgent because at, at the post office will literally run out of money due to the impact of the revenue losses due to COVID. And without taxpayer relief, which is not the norm, it, it just runs off postage, then that's, that's gonna cause the, the, a, an, an, an extreme crisis. And U.S. Democrats kicked off an unprecedented political experiment beginning Monday, an all-virtual national convention that nominates Joe Biden as their White House candidate to battle President Trump in the heat of a deadly pandemic. Market University professor Charles Franklin said the effects of this non-convention remain to be seen and says in contrast to the 2016 election, Joe Biden is not seen as negatively by Republicans as Hillary Clinton was. Mm. Parochially for the city and the state, it's a huge loss because we had expected a giant convention and much work had gone into preparing for it. All of that's lost. So locally, we feel very much the, the loss of it. The political impact, though, I think is more likely to be equal between the parties because the Republicans are not going to have an in-person convention either. After the conventions is when we've historically seen support for the candidates move around a good bit. Uh, people have seen the conventions, they've seen the nominees, have begun to focus on politics. So I think that's the thing to watch for, but admit we really don't know whether this sort of non-convention or virtual convention plus a speech uh, will have anything like the kind of short-term impacts that we've seen in previous elections. This time, we've seen three and a half years of the Trump administration. People have formed very strong opinions either for him or against him. So I don't think there's nearly the amount of uncertainty that there was in 2016. So far, at least, Joe Biden is not seen as negatively by Republicans as Hillary Clinton was though he's certainly not seen positively among Republicans, but he doesn't have that, that deep antipathy uh, that there was towards Clinton. We are, in fact, a competitive state. Three of the last five presidential elections were decided by less than one percentage point here, and all three of those by less than 23,000 votes statewide. Only the two Obama elections of this century have been relatively large victories. I don't think the Biden campaign is not campaigning here. We're seeing very substantial media buys and social media uh, efforts here in the state. On the other hand, the lack of a personal appearance is at least symbolic given what happened in 2016. It also reflects Republicans' greater willingness to hold in-person events for the president and the vice president to travel and do those, whether they're rallies or tours of factories or speeches. The coronavirus epidemic is a big, big issue this fall. And the president has been coming down in approval on that, whereas the Democratic governor's approval is at 61% in our 
August data. So this is a real liability for Trump as we go into the fall. And the course of the virus will play, I think, a, a big role in uh, the next three months of campaigning. In other news, I can't live here anymore. Uh, Beirut Blast Survivor recounts the moment in his life the moment his life changed forever when a large fire broke out causing an explosion at the Beirut port near his workplace. Now, Shady whipped out his phone and started filming, but he had no idea an even bigger explosion would follow, one that would disfigure the city, kill 171 people, and wound more than 6,000, dealing a sickening blow to a country already in crisis. Take a look. Yeah. ما بحس بشيء ما غبت عن الوعي ما بعرف كيف كان شيء حسيت كانه شيء فويد شيء فراغ كان في فراغ يعني ما كان في اكسجين كنا عم نصرخ كثير بينزلونا على الدرج اللي هو كله مكسر اللي هو ما بعرف كيف نزلنا على الدرج من الطابق الخامس لتحت حجار عم بفوتوا فينا، حجار عم بفوتوا بجسمنا باجريه اجريه تشطبوا على الاخر ونزلونا على الطريق اللي هو كمان هونيك التروما، هونيك الاصوات العالم اللي عم تبكي وتصرخ وتطلع فيي بتبلش تسكر لي ايدي تسكر لي اجري وبتوصل على هيد الايد وبتصرخ دكتور سيلارتير صرخت I was like شو ارتير لم بتذكر انا دارس كمان بيرسونال ترينر سو بتذكر اللي درسته ارتير هو اكبر شريان اللي بيوصل على القلب اي جاس او شيء هيك سو قلت خلاص يلا باي حتى عندي فيلمز اختفى شيء اسمه احساس مني يعني صرت شوف العالم عم بتموت ما حس بشيء ما ما دمع ما بنط فيه ولا شيء نو دكتورز اوف ذا وورلد اند انترناشونال تشاريتي سبنت سيفرال دايز ان ذا ليفل كارانتينا ديستريكت اوفرلوكينج بلاست سايد اتس ستاف نوكت اون دورز ان ذا اريا تو اوفر ريزيدنتس فري سايكولوجيكال سبورت ليبنان سيلف مينستر وارن مونداي ذات هوسبيتالز اولسو ار ناو ريتشينج ماكسيموم كاباسيتي تو تريت كورونا فايروس بيشنتس افتر ذا ديدلي بيروت بلاست اوفرويلم كلينكس اند اس كوفيد 19 كيسز اولسو ماونت Lebanon has also seen a spike in uh, coronavirus-related cases and deaths in recent weeks, and they have hit a new record in the aftermath of the massive explosion that ripped through large parts of Beirut on August 4. The disaster, which killed 177 people and wounded more than 6,500, many by falling debris and flying glass as windows shattered, caused pandemonium in the capital's already pandemic-stretched hospitals. Firefighters in life jackets waded through chest-high water to rescue around 20 dogs trapped at a pet hospital in southwest China's Sichuan province as heavy rain and flooding doused the region. Take a look. <laughs> hospital employees and their canine wards were trapped in the clinic in Chengdu City after water rose up to the building's second floor, according to state broadcaster CCTV. But uh, rescuers lifted the dogs onto bright orange rafts to ferry them across the muddy water with one small mutt making the journey in a green cycling bin. All humans and animals trapped in the hospital were eventually taken to safety after six hours of work, according to the, to the rescuers. Summer flooding has been an annual scourge since Asian times, typically focused in the vast and heavily populated Yangtze Basin, the drain central China, 
Rising waters across central and eastern China this year have left over 210 people dead or missing, and floods have destroyed 54,000 homes, according to Chinese Ministry of Emergency Management. In other news, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced that Israel is working on direct flights over Saudi Arabia between Tel Aviv, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi as part of the UAE-Israeli deal during a tour of Ben Gurion Airport. Israel said Sunday that citizens, residents, and foreign workers returning from 20 countries would be exempted from a 14-day coronavirus quarantine period but kept its borders closed to tourists. Take a look. על לאפשר טיסות ישירות מעל סעודיה בין תל אביב לדובאי ולאבו דאבי. זה טיסה קצרה מאוד של שלוש שעות, בערך כמו טיסה לרומא, אבל זה ישנה את התעופה הישראלית ואת הכלכלה הישראלית בהיקף אדיר של תיירות לשני הצדדים. The Israeli and UAE foreign ministers inaugurated on Sunday direct phone services as well between the two countries in their first announced call after an agreement to normalize relations. Phone links for the public were also functioning between the two countries. The Israel-UAE deal announced by U.S. President Trump on Thursday is only the third such accord Israel has struck with an Arab country and raises the prospect of similar deals with other Western, pro-Western Gulf states. President Trump said leaders from the two countries would sign the agreement at the White House in around three weeks. Under the deal, Israel pledged to suspend its planned annexation of West Bank territories, a concession welcomed by European and some pro-Western Arab governments as a boost for hopes of peace. But Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu stressed Israel wasn't abandoning its plans to one day annex the Jordan Valley and Jewish settlements across the occupied West Bank. All right, and now to sports. Raptors and Nets in the first round of NBA playoffs. Here's an update from Sharita Sese from our EBC Canada Bureau. Now that the restart of the NBA season has come and gone, 16 of the league's top teams look ahead to the long-awaited postseason. After a nail-biting play-in game between the Memphis Grizzlies and the Portland Trailblazers, the seating is now locked in. Ask any Raptor fan who was around in 2014, and they can probably recall the exact moment when former Raptor Terrence Ross was able to get a steal from Paul Pierce, and with 0.1 second left, Kyle Lowry threw up a shot only to be blocked by none other than Paul Pierce on the other end of the court. Six years later, Canada's team is looking for revenge as they face the Brooklyn Nets for the first round rematch. The second seed Toronto Raptors will meet the seventh seed Brooklyn Nets in a best of seven game series in the Disney bubble. Despite the seeding of these two teams, the Raptors will have their hands full with this resilient Nets team who went five and three in the bubble, beating heavy hitters like the Milwaukee Bucks and the LA Clippers while almost eliminating the Trailblazers completely from the playoffs. If the Nets are to have any chance against the reigning champions, their star Karis LeVert, who averaged 25 points per game while in Florida and was named the Bubbles All-NBA second team, will need to keep up this momentum. When it comes to Toronto, they will need to keep doing what they've been doing in this Disney bubble, and that's to let their defense do the talking. During the restart, the Raptors were able to go 7-1 against strong teams like the Lakers, Bucks, and 76ers, while also maintaining the best defense in the league. On the other hand, the Raptors should not have any issues producing offense as their backcourt of Fred Van Vliet and Kyle Lowry have averaged a combined 25 points per game while in the bubble. Toronto has also shown their depth in the past couple games where bench players like Matt Thomas, who scored 25 points against the Bucks, and Stanley Johnson, who scored 23 points against the Nuggets, have emerged as potential threats off the bench. Many have predicted that the Raptors should have no problem handling this young Nets team, with some even calling for a sweep. But given how unpredictable the Disney bubble has been, anything can happen. From Toronto, Canada, Zarita Sesse, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. And before we close, we leave you with a word of hope. At the end of the day, there remains so much more to be grateful for. See you again tomorrow evening. Good night. I'm Alma Angeles. We live in interesting times.